Okay, so um, I learned the first night that most people use Moodle. I mean, I was just been learning from the minute I arrived. And so I put this together not knowing the, you know, my audience really and who would know what. And so please, this could be a dialogue for sure. Let me see um, if I can you know, fill in some blanks from what I've put on this PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Um, so my, the timeline is actually for this particular like faculty training, because this is under faculty training. But we've been using Moodle for a long time, a number of years, and I don't know how many. Um, and this information services librarian position, as I said, it's been evolving. For the past five years, we've had one staff person that was the point person for uh, Moodle use, and then our IT department you know, kind of supports, we have the server on our campus. So we've had 1.9 for a long time, and whenever we got that, there were people who didn't, who chose not to adopt it. I think the reputation was established that it's kind of a pain to learn, it's optional at our roads. So, or most people, does anybody have a school where it's required to use the LMS? I mean, I, I don't even know the tone that people have in different institutions. So, um, we began publicizing in February, in the spring semester, that we were going to have this upgrade um, in the fall of this year. And so we wanted to make sure nobody was taken by surprise. Everybody had plenty of time in addition to the other things they do as faculty members. So um, we planned two lunch and learns, and we happened to have um, a lot of uh, opportunity here. This was a good time because our refectory had been completely renovated and has this new smart classroom dining room. I couldn't find a good picture. I should have gone to take a picture of it, but it's got a vaulted ceiling. It's got a, a huge flat screen TV now. A really comfortable place to have dialogue. So that's a really important piece that we wanted to use this. We wanted to invite people to come and have a reason to come to this room. Now this room is booked so much. We have to we have to grab our spaces when we want to do our lunch and learns because it's open to the campus. And so we wanted to have two lunch and learns are really conversations. And then we later in the semester, we opened our, um, our library lab for these afternoon workshops where we were there for like three or four hours and let professors come and go to really deal with them more one-on-one -on -one for um, learning how to back up their courses and take ownership of their courses as we migrated the server, which we're gonna have to do to implement 2.4. I guess I should ask too, like, is anybody using 2.4 or higher? I know Candace said 2.2, and so is anybody still on 1.9? Okay, so, and I'm still learning about all of this myself, but the other thing that we needed to do is let everyone know that we now have these two other staff members who are point persons, point people for Moodle, because everybody, they submit a help desk ticket, but it would be addressed to Greg, Greg Parham. Um, you know, Greg this, Greg that, and my cue was next to his, and his phone would ring off the hook, and it was just Moodle questions, and so everybody was bypassing help desk, what I talked about yesterday, to contact Greg. So we needed to let them know that now we've, we've tripled our staff for this, and so, here you go, an opportunity to, uh, to learn it if you've never learned it. Uh, you've got help, you've got lots of friendly help, um, and we need you to be aware of what's happening because we need you to own your courses because our server had actually filled up. Like we were having to archive large courses mm -hmm. and um, like I don't know a lot of the technical stuff about that, but we were in dire need to, make, to do this upgrade. So our goals for the Lunch and Learn was to really hear from our heavy users the um, components that they used, how they used it, their wish list, you know, to see if it matched, because we were gonna do testing all summer, so we wanted to see what do they want it to do, and does this do that? So, um, we, and we also needed to make sure we had them before they just, they fly the coop at some <laughs> summer at Rhodes, because we don't really teach those classes in the summer and to try to break some bad habits of the way people are using it and their courses were just these, you know, they were, there were a lot of them that were kind of messy and icky and we knew they probably weren't gonna transfer over. Any questions? I feel like I'm going kind of fast as I'm not missing anything and it's obvious. So we feel like the inviting people to these lunches allowed for a lot of personal interaction. We had like 12 to 15 professors for both. We tried to do one on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule, and one on a Tuesday, Thursday. And we reached out to the people who were heavy users and please come, please 
um, tell us what you like about Moodle now and what you would like to see. Um, and then they started asking each other lots of questions and basically we took a lot of notes. We had a, we had the new version to show them some of the features and how it looked different and we were going to just you know show, go through that. And then they started talking and we were just like, oh my gosh, we should do this more often because foreign language people were saying, you know, does it, what is the, how large are the audio files on the new, you know, um, what can you do with this? Is Turnitin, the Turnitin integration was huge and we needed to test that and see how it worked because people were like, I've heard about Turnitin, but I'm not going to use it until it works with, uh, you know, Moodle fully integrated because with 1.9 you actually had to go to Turnitin and go to Moodle. So now it's all together. Um, so we just started keep we just started keeping notes as they were talking, just every little question. And we actually we have SharePoint, so we have a team site for our library IT, and we went back and used the discussion board piece of the SharePoint um, uh, team site, which you know a lot of times we're there in the building, so we don't really need the, to do that. But we did question by question. We probably had like thirty or more and so we took each one of them and in the summer we were able to take those questions and do the testing put on our discussion board what we figured out and found out and then we got back personally with those professors with an email just saying you know either I, I never found out the intruder question but we're gonna we'll, you know keep that in mind as we keep going some of them were really far-fetched stuff they had a lot of questions about students with um, with disabilities that needed separate timing for their quizzes. Like we started digging into things that we didn't really know they were using or, or maybe just didn't know the details of because mostly what we do is get people started using it and a lot of the people who are independent with technology just figure it out on their own. Um, I should have come up with a list of the, uh, some of the other things about um, you know using groups and some of the finer points of, of Moodle. So we got back to everyone's questions, which we just felt like we needed to really be courteous. We needed to have this new face of, you know, we've got this LMS and we want to be your friend and partner, which before it kind of felt like Greg was just like putting out fires all the time. So um, the workshops were good. People came. We got to see their courses. We got to show them how to back it up and show them that they needed to make sure they kept that themselves because the server was going away. The server went away for people, but we can still, for our, our faculty, but we can still get course material off and um, just, well, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but we do still need to have access to that old stuff. Okay. So we learned that, we learned the procedures for moving the course over and what didn't move easily because of the huge jump in versions because we were skipping over the versions and there was a big change I guess the 2.4 was the big change. Um, who? Uh, okay, thanks. And then how these features worked in the new, we, we just tested the heck out of it over the summer. We tried to. But we still have to understand how people teach to be able to test it well. And I think we could have gotten even more from these professors. Uh, and some of them were willing to sit down with us and show us how they structure their quizzes, how they refine their quizzes. They can use the analytics in. Moodle to see how the students answer the questions. If a bunch of students answered it wrong, they can they can go back and look and say, I must have structured this question wrong if more people were not answering it correctly. And um, so we've gotten some professors to really dialogue with us. Because we can make test courses and we can even ask our student workers to do, it is not the same as being, you know, holding a class. I don't know if anybody has other ideas about how to kind of get to the meat of that. That's not so much another idea. Sorry, mm -hmm. a different thing. But uh, we look at our yes, uh, we look at our high, uh, our faculty who highly yeah. use particular features. We haven't found one person that uses everything. everything right? Okay, yeah. uh, except for a couple people who teach you know highly funded learning high classes. Um, so what we look is for is high activity on certain features by certain people. So we do a little bit of deep dive data mining to see what people are doing, and then we reach out to those people, and they're the ones that we talk to for. Things. Right. But yes, it's still we yeah. still need to know how they're actually doing things, yeah. how they're really using it, so we can do a better right. testing right. with them. Okay, so really, you're somebody who was talking about the food thing and food being like a bribe or something. Mm -hmm. Who are you talking about? Oh, yeah. 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 But I don't really think it's a bribe because I think I really think that a that's the time people have to to take out of their schedule, and b 
you connect with people yeah. over food and drink. I mean, it, we're just, it's a human thing. I'm sure we could probably describe that anthropologically or something, but, um, but it really made them more relaxed because this Moodle thing, people get tense about this and, you know, they, they have their priorities and learning a technology is not, is not high and it roads the atmosphere, you know, the tone is still, it's very traditional, you know, I teach and I do it this way and does this fit with what I do? So it was, it was good and it opened up a lot of communication across um, departments. That's nice. Um, that's really my presentation. That's um, the library, another image of our library, uh, ex external and the apps. Um, and so it's really faculty training. I think our success was that it wasn't a, it wasn't built like as a workshop open to the public. It, we just really tried to make it more, um, more uh, congenial and friendly, and I think that we'll do it again. Uh, what I didn't put in the presentation is after we got to August, um, we actually had a server on during the summer that some professors were willing to build to pre-build their courses for the fall. That we ended up having to move over to our real server, our live server later, and we had to really help them do a lot of that just because we kind of didn't explain what was going to happen. But we did get the heavy users to back up their courses. And since we had had Moodle for at least since 2009 and maybe earlier, some people had built 10, 12 courses. Some sciences had meta courses and lab research um, materials that we needed to make sure all of that was backed up and moved over. And what most of the time, a course wouldn't back up and it would just get stuck if there was a problem. We could go and look and see what files were sticking. But what I realized recently, a physics professor said, I'm using my, um, it's like a physics research, it, it doesn't, it's a course, but it goes like a lot of students look at it. Um, and he said, the wikis didn't move over. And so I went, got in there and I just realized that, like the, the that activity had moved, but it was just the <coughs> HTML didn't move, so I just cut and pasted. It was two wikis and they weren't that complex, so I just cut and pasted the HTML. So a lot of times we might, we probably should have done research as to why those wikis didn't move over, but we just wanted him to be able to get to the stuff, so we did it that way. Um, the quizzes that the art history people had that had images in it, the way the image files moved, they couldn't view the images, but it was like a tweaking the HTML thing, and I think Greg figured out a way to change them in a batch way. I, I don't do that. Um, so it was little things like that, um, but we have really gotten a lot of people to use the Turnitin feature, and I was talking at my table about, they don't care so much about the plagiarism ratings, it's the comments and creating their mm -hmm. custom comments and that kind of thing. So we have a faculty member, English faculty member, who's in charge of our first year writing seminar, who's our Turnitin, like she's our account a point person, but she's now asked that somebody from IT library also be like the representative for turn it in as well. So we can get more people accustomed to it and trained in. I guess we might do workshops or you know however we do it at Rhodes, which we tend to feel like one-on-one -on -one is better. We're so happy we have a variety of faces in the information services um, area because I think people really do approach who they're comfortable with. And because we're generalists, we can we can do that, you know, if somebody's really intimidated by technology and feels better talking to someone who like I'm not the super techie nerd, they might want to call me. If I can't answer it, I'll get somebody else in. And then other people only want to talk to Greg. So I've only dealt with Greg, I've dealt with Greg all the way through. You're new, I don't have any time and patience for you, so. Do you have any um, faculty lead workshops on Moodle yeah, for other faculty or? Faculty who lead workshops on Moodle mm -hmm. for others? No, but we do put them in touch with each other like one-on-one. -on -one. We've asked certain faculty, can we refer people to you if they're building a quiz bank or whatever? Yeah. But I think we'd love to go into that and that I mentioned that common table, ha having this teaching and learning working group. Like, mm -hmm. we are probably never gonna have the job title instructional technologist where we are just because of philosophy we've adopted, but we are moving with this working group towards having this kind of exchange and that's where we would like to have a professor come and share under this common table being the, the idea of um, thrusting it or whatever. We had, we had one faculty member um, come and give like a demonstration of how she set up her grade book. Yes, and, that would be great. You know, and it was, uh -huh. there was a lot more 
engagement from the faculty members that yes. came to the session. Yeah. So it was just really good. Yeah, we we I could definitely see that 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 could happen. That road. That, that would be a really good way to get the information. And it is. It's better to come from the faculty member because they can um, they can say what's worked for them as an instructor. Yeah. And, and we just don't do we don't do it. I just kind of wanted to throw out an idea. I don't know if there's any yeah. real value in it, but thinking about how to grow this partnership right between uh -huh. between faculty and, and um, technologists. And maybe this doesn't apply so much to Moodle because I don't know how much of what's going on on Moodle actually happens in the classroom. Uh -huh. But I'm wondering if it would ever be valuable under any circumstances to do like a teaching observation. You know, not in the same sense that someone's going to do that for their tenure file or anything right. like that, but just to have some folks come into the classroom so they actually understand kind of what that environment's about. That's, it's a really interesting divide because right. that's a space that, you know, yeah. non-students, well, what am I trying to say? That's a space that's typically just, you know, the faculty and their students, and it, to get people in there might communicate um, in an interesting yeah. new way, you know? Yeah, and, and, and some understanding. And probably this is common everywhere, but we have some people that we just really tried to get to use Moodle instead of the file server. They still mm -hmm. tell their students that mm -hmm. all my readings are on the file server and that's really hard to deal with off campus. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've we tried to just get people to use it in that really basic way and then there are other people that use it more full fledged mm -hmm. and use different of the different um, modules of uh, activities, whatever they're called. I really like 2.4 in that there's one big list of all the activities and what's the other thing called that used to be resources, resources in two lists. And we were talking about the pros and cons of that, but I like that it comes up in one list and you can hit the little button and it gives you a description of what it might be used for. Um, it seems just like it's a little easier to um, use. Uh, although some people said the most basic features are at the bottom of the list, like just adding a file and adding a link are not at the top. <laughs> so, um, but no, that's a great, that's a great idea. Um, I mean, there's probably only some faculty that that would really work well for, because people right. can be sort of funny about that. But, um, but if you have someone who's doing really exemplary, mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. things, you know. Yeah. We also found that we have a we have this humanities course course that's short short name or nickname is the search course the search for meaning in Western history and religion that sounds exactly what it's called it's just one semester and no the <laughs> semester. it's a short course religion you take religion courses or you take this search course which is a you know multidisciplinary humanities yeah. course but like this semester 27 instructors from different departments teach search and we had these meta courses on 1.9 that just were like they were just <laughs> they were huge and they had all the teachers who had ever taught it on there and so I went and met with the head of search and I was like um, I'll move these over for you but and I you guys need to fix these courses like <laughs> they had just junk and syllabi from I mean, they were just a mess, and I was like, "Do y'all are y'all really using these? And are like, maybe we need some other way to keep these readings? Uh, you know, like what what's going on here?" And it gave them a chance to evaluate. So upgrades can be time to clear clean house, you know, get that stuff out from under the bed, and um, throw out get the bones stuff. Yeah, the skeletons and cobwebs and everything. Yeah, and it's still. It's very difficult search. They rotate the um, administrative assistant that's over search between different departments, so it's not the same person no. who's been hurting these professors. And I'd it's like a great to, course. But. I'd like to ask a, a different question related mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has really struck me as we've moved our email to a hosted, and most everybody here has hosted email in some way, um, you know, when that first happened, the scariest part of that for me was that Google just does an upgrade whenever they wish, <laughs> right? Yeah. Just whenever they wish. Yeah. And you know. somehow our faculty just fly with that. Yeah. Right. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Google's doing the upgrade, so yeah. it's okay. Yeah. I can deal with suddenly this looking different, suddenly my having to do something differently, yeah. but because it comes from Google, it's okay. Yeah. And yet we still spend 
huge amounts yeah. of time yeah. and angst mm -hmm. worrying about doing a point upgrade. Right. Right? Oh, well, we can't be during classes, so we all have to work Thanksgiving. It, you know, I mean, and I make my folks do that too. Thanksgiving, Christmas, right? Because it's a point upgrade and it could cause some problem. And you have a summer. Lucky yeah. you. Yeah. We, we literally do not have a day yeah. when people are not in session yeah. at, on this campus. Because yeah. our business school runs... 12 months a year. So if we need to upgrade Blackboard, we have to figure out when the fewest classes are in session, and then we have to talk to those faculty who are teaching during that holiday period and work through all these negotiations. Are, are we overthinking this? Should we, should we just start being Google? Surprise. I think what you should do is announce that you've outsourced Blackboard to another provider. Just another server. Just another piece. Sort of like what happens with email. And this is really great and it's more redundant, but you know, there will be times when they just upgrade like Google. Because I have a funny feeling that people are perfectly willing to accept the fact that it's out of our yeah. control, yeah. but as yeah. long as they can call you on the phone, yeah. they're going to turn around and insist on things happening. So we just all should lie. <laughs> <laughs> so if Google acquires it now, <laughs> well then it's going to fall in their butthole. So right. It's a question that we talk about all the time, um, and my husband and I talk about it too. He's got the same... He's brought that up for a long time. That you know, Google. we're so delicate and careful with these things. And you know, like when we did, we moved to Outlook 365 server about a year and a half ago, and um, most people were fine with it. But like when they do upgrades, every people will put an out just to get. I can't find anything now in my email, and like, why does it look different? And can I go back? I would like to go back to the old look, you know. And then we explain. That you can't. And, and they go on. Where's the black Yeah, heart? and they live. Yeah. They go yeah. on and they right. live. Yeah. And we don't really hear that many complaints. Right. right. So, and I don't think people were complaining about this. I think we had, and maybe we carried this kind of anxiety about how much work was it going to be for us. And even with all this preparation, you know, there were still people that came a week before classes started, and all they, they were like, I logged in and I don't see my I don't see any of my courses. I don't, where are my courses? And, you know, like, um, and so at that point, there wasn't really time to explain much to them. We explained what was going on, but we just got into the 1.9 server and put their courses there. But we said, we've only put the courses that you're teaching this semester. You need to make an appointment with us, and we need to get you your other courses. You've got to hold on to those from, from here on out, because that was this new policy. The server's not a storage space. And does anybody, is that how, like, I don't know the history of why that happened, but that was a bad choice for us because it filled up too fast. But do people have, every semester, do they say, you got to take your courses off and store these files? No. 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 Oh, no, we tell them. Sorry, we tell them. Actually, we just recently had an update. Our registrar was uh, asked by the cabinet to tell faculty about a new uh, data retention policy about so yeah. there's a guideline, it's still not a policy. Uh -huh. That faculty need to keep all student yeah. grades for five years and yeah. all this kind of stuff. And it's it's related to SACS, but it's not a part of accreditation. But it was one of the things that was asked for. And so we, we slipped it in there as a reminder, we have had a policy for LMS that people are supposed to be doing that every semester. Uh -huh. We have been on the background scripting backups of all courses yeah. for the last couple yeah. of years. Yeah. Um, that we keep those and you know, sort of are pulling the rabbit out of the hat kind of thing in yeah. case someone yeah, we, really bites the big one. But right, but so our policy now is two <clears throat> two prior semesters will be kept. But we can't keep five years. Mm -hmm. of oh, it. but what we about classes that are only off every two, once every two years, years or, so, yeah. Yeah. or three years? You're asking good questions that yeah. I don't know. We yeah. we. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we, we are either going to have to train them to have their stuff, but what we're telling them now, we're not really taking that stuff off yet. We're not. So, I'm not that. I, Greg should be here. <laughs> we run, we run both this. servers. We run the 1.9 and 2.4, so uh -huh. we just redirect it as like an archive type thing. Uh -huh. But we uh -huh. tend to keep, keep them all on there probably about four years or so. Four years. And then we just back, 
I mean, just back up the rest of the CDs and then you can know it. But I see. it's just more of a comfort feeling. Right. Like, oh, I can still yeah. see it. But we don't load any students. We don't load anything. We just leave it there. Yeah. And they can just download the materials. Like and when you archive it, do you archive the student data as well, or you just yeah, archive? Don't. You don't archive the user data. Right. 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 We don't. Yeah. Yeah. We don't. We don't. It doesn't go default. Right. We have some classes that are only offered every two years. Yeah. So we have to keep that in time. So right. We have that too. And I was wondering on the on the transferring. You mentioned that wikis didn't transfer over. Uh, we have some of our language faculty have very involved closed quiz questions. Uh -huh. hmm. And do they, do they move over properly from one to nine to two something? There is a great tool that you okay. can use to transfer one. Oh, I'm Closed? I made the same mistake. Okay. 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 This was Blackboard. Uh, Blackboard. 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 Um, are the quizzes moved? Soft chalk. Moved? What is it? Soft, soft chalk. It was images that was like links to things. Yeah. It was the way that HTML was written that caused us the most problems. If people, we had some biology professors who, oh, um, who, you know, the I guess I could go to Moodle. Um, From one point nine to point four. The introductory boxes for a course course where you can put an image in. Close question. That was their whole course. So they they put the whole thing, they had written it in HTML. Yeah. You know, they just, so they were trying, you're right. They went to their old website, they copied the entire HTML, just basically. Yes. Yeah. 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 Including like short videos and stuff. And we, that was the Brad Havitt stuff that we needed to break. Because they weren't using any of the features. They were just dumping HTML into that one editing box. And it was really weird to find. We were finding stuff we didn't know. We didn't look at all the courses. The journal in 1.9 was a one-to-one conversation. I've got to ask you now, that's something. How many of y'all are using Turnitin, and are you using it for the peer check, that kind of peer editing and the other sources, not the plagiarism part so much? We were using Turnitin, and we went, and I was telling our table last night, we went from 1.9 to 2.2, mm -hmm. and, um, and our classroom person was the one that helped hand, handle the back end. Well, we realized shortly after that there were glitches because the user mm -hmm. IDs that Turnitin associated in 1.9, they reassociated them, and so the students weren't matched. Right. So we're in the process. We've been for a year and a half trying to clear out oh, those issues. Um, but we do have uh, a lot of faculty that do their turn in assignments and then also assign peer mark, our mm -hmm. uh, political science and uh, psychology and a lot of them. And they love it, but now we're having issues. Well, we're just having issues because it still syncs. If you do a roster sync, it still you see all the student names. But in parentheses, it associates like Eunice Wentz with somebody else, like Bob right. Smith. And so <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure that out. So anybody that hasn't moved, if you use turn in 1.9, just be cautious. And I don't know if it's our integration it system or not. Yeah, it didn't happen. That did not happen with us. Yeah. It was because we were right. ready when we tested it to find to figure that something would be wrong with turn it in. It, it works beautifully. We love it. And we've got, like, I'm kind of embedded with a first year writing seminar class where the instructor wanted to use Moodle. It's the one where she uploaded the textbook, a Norton textbook that has all the music and everything. And she's using Turnitin for the grading for this writing intensive yeah. music course. And she's been really happy with it. I just have to show her the settings with Turnitin. There's like the general Moodle settings where the gear is. But then in the assignment, there's also another set of settings. It's just doesn't, it's not very intuitive. But the, the integration and the syncing is happening and the students can see their comments and yeah. um, she's using it for comments. Um, I don't know many professors that use the peer grading in Turnitin, but I don't think it's hard. I mean, I think. No, I just wondered if people were yeah. using yeah. it. We're, we're Blackboard, but we use it. Our yeah. faculty use it for both peer, peer and. Peer writing and then the revision. So you can, revision. all three steps are in there and the yeah. students keep clicking on the exact same thing. It's amazing. Yeah. Wait, do you guys use that Southwestern? No, no. Okay. no. I have so far every I don't I couldn't say for Southwestern, but every institution I've been at has refused to have it because they didn't want to turn in student work to turn it in. Right. So that was the yeah. so I just asked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody they, they else? They didn't want what? They didn't want the student work to be stored somewhere else. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well it's because Turnitin's business is based on the fact that they keep copies of all of these papers, which is how they build their database for plagiarism. So it was just for faculty at other institutions I've been at, that was an issue and they didn't want to do that. Does anybody else subscribe to that? Well, there's cool, no, what I mean, subscribe to that philosophy that we don't want our papers in turn it in. I don't, I don't know, I've never heard of it before, but, um, <laughs> but actually if it gives the um, professors a much better way to do comments or an easier way, yeah. that would be a huge yeah. benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, that's what most Rhodes right. professors use it for. But I don't know, I've never read the fine print for turn it in, like, can you opt out? Look at the papers, paper by paper, or like you know what's mm -hmm. happening. You can't you know, opt out. You, can you can you can opt out of the student database. Yeah. Uh, I see. Mm -hmm. Which they didn't use to let you do yeah. Yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. But so. students sometimes we have the honor code on campus, yeah. so they have yeah. to sign the yeah. So some students do say, "Why are you putting my paper through this? Right. This is a sign of distrust." Right. Yeah. Right. And then. You can tell them whatever, but some students don't necessarily well, like it. You can set the okay. settings to, you know, eliminate the common phrases, or you, you can right. do different uh, strengths of comparison or whatever. Right. But I could, under, I could understand that. I mean, right. I think I was really, yeah. I wasn't used to, I'll have to admit, when I came to Southwestern with the honor code where faculty right. members are not in the room yeah. when exams are given. Scary. So, yeah, I could think that some students would go and you're sending my paper in to right. check. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I personally would never use Turnitin because I totally believe that. Yeah. If you're going to believe in your honor code, believe in your honor code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to believe in your honor code, don't have it. But if the best. message to the students is you're not telling your, your honor code. You're, yeah, you're not believing in your honor code yeah. if you put my paper through Turnitin. I just so. say I don't, want to, I don't want to tempt you. There's another yeah. side of that, though. I think our faculty use it as a, as a tool, right. not as a, as a, I don't trust you, but as a tool to have the right. students always see the markings, too, right. so they understand, um, you know, the proper ways to decide how yeah. much you should use it. It's yeah. more of a tool yeah. than yeah. a punishment. Especially um, yeah. for beginning writing classes, often they don't, because they copy-paste from the internet exactly. all the time, they don't even quite understand what this mm -hmm. means to yeah. cite, yeah. to write. Mm -hmm. I've often found that students don't quite have a full grasp of what right. plagiarism actually is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. seeing these oh. highlights and whoa, this came from <laughs> yeah. real, yeah. the first, second yeah. time, like 50% of this was actually not original, is a nice shock for them to get, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if it doesn't yeah. reflect in their grade. Well, and they're they chunking in all these block quotes, and, you know, their papers right. are mostly these right. big quotes, it does let you see that. So. Right. I'm curious, Michael, what, do you, what version of Moodle do you guys have at Turnitin? Um, not the newest one, the one right before it. Okay. Two, whatever. Two, four? Two. Yeah, I think it's two, four. Two, I, I, help, I, help teach, I help teach people how to use it because I actually teach a course with it, and that's mm -hmm. how I've gotten the trust, which I were yeah. saying earlier. So I, I really have no disconnect that's great. with the faculty because I actually use it. Yeah. But, but we just got a new Moodle person because our guy left, so he's up, you know, and, and then we'll move it over and we'll implement any box connection too, like I said yesterday. I'm just curious, like other Moodle people, how was y'all's transition from 1.9 to 2.4 as far as the course restores? Did it happen? We went from 1.9 to 2.2 and it was just a disaster. Okay. A disaster. Say, oh, when I say disaster, it took weeks and weeks of really hard work to, to solve problems with a lot of courses that didn't transfer over. Right. And what was really unfortunate was we did a whole lot of testing on a test server, and the courses that we randomly selected to test all transferred perfectly. <laughs> I think I did, I picked six different courses, mm -hmm. small, large, different departments, images, quizzes, everything, and they all transferred perfectly. And then when we actually did the real transfer, <laughs> we found out that those random six were in the you know, 30% that work perfectly. <laughs> do, you, do you pick lottery numbers? <laughs> <laughs> we don't want him. <laughs> so with, with lottery numbers, you pick the, the one right. that he does not, not pick. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a lot of student workers that summer uh, doing a lot of manual stuff. What we, what we found was that just files would crash the yeah. restore in 2.2, specific files. Some courses it would be one file, and other courses it would be dozens. And so you couldn't really isolate 
it was mostly PDFs, I think I was telling you guys. And so you'd think that one course with 20 PDFs would be a problem. Not necessarily. Some would work perfectly. So we never actually isolated what it was that was causing the problem. It wasn't smooth. What could have happened, though, is 2.4 literally could have resolved a lot of the yeah. issues we didn't, so that the backup and restore. Yeah, we didn't batch transfer. Basically, what we did, we started with a clean slate. We um, we put in the like the banner stuff gets put in, so the courses are there, but they're all empty. Mm -hmm. They have the student, they have the students in there, and the course names in there for each professor. But we literally were asking, and I didn't make the decision to do it this way. I just helped implement. But we were really asking professors to either build new courses, or if you had a course that you wanted, we we're going to move over what you're teaching this semester, and we we're going to teach you how to hold on to all the rest of them. So if you have something you teach every two years or whatever, I'll come to your office and show you how to hold on to that course, and we'll move it in, help you move it in when it's time to move it in. But you've got to put it in the safety deposit box uh, for when you go to teach it again. And if you've got 20 courses created in 1.9 and you only really use three of those, then just leave the rest behind. We're not we're not moving everything over. And that's that's, that's how it works too. for us. Huh? That's what Furman did too, uh -huh. and kept up. I think both servers are still up, and we're yeah. going to take it down in a few months. But yeah. they had to export everything out and put it back in and start it new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's kind of how we have access to the old, and we probably will for a while because we, like we, like you said, we don't want to throw it all away, but we've got to wean off, and we have just, it's just like you know, when you've got too many pairs of shoes, you got to throw them. <laughs> <laughs> just have, we have too many bows in your closet. Just, yeah. Scan your shoes. Yeah. I'd like to just add. <laughs> to that too, just remind them to back it up somewhere else too. Yes. yes. Like you were saying. Yes. We have had several requests recently where at the course they haven't taught in two years, but right. they're, they lost their, you know, something happened oh, to their yeah. computer, that's our, and so yeah. luckily then we have the archive to yeah. get that content, but we're having that same discussion. How long are we keeping those archives? We're not going to keep them forever. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what the, that's what this dialogue has been, and I just don't know. Some people are getting it, and some people really don't understand storage. It's like, no. it's, when it's not concrete. <laughs> and tangible, like they really don't have a concept of it. You know, so you have to use these analogies like we're putting it in the safe deposit box and you know, don't keep it on the junk drive. You're gonna lose the junk drive, it's gonna not work or whatever. Um, but we do back up the hard drives on campus. You know, we don't, we don't have like a perfect policy, but what we've got to let them know is, and some people already subscribe to this, this is your property, this is your course. Mm -hmm. You know, this is your, this belongs to you. And some people are like that. They don't want even. I mean, we have professors whose syllabi. We've been, we had been putting syllabi on the institutional repository, and some people were like, "You cannot put mine on there. You cannot be open access. I don't want anybody to see what I teach and how I teach. That's my property." Right. So, so it's interesting. <laughs> Is anybody going to make the jump to 2.5? I want to. You are. For the summer. I don't make the decision, but. <laughs> we will. I've heard good reviews. About yeah, it. Nice time ago. But I, I, when you were talking about the timing, I, I don't think that we overthink it. I mean, like, you really don't, you don't want to just ad hoc have a change right in the middle of a term. I mean, I think we still have to, to talk about trying to get the best timing, and we all know there, you know, there, we talk about perfect, no, you know, cor courses aren't going to be perfect, but most faculty are happy if they get, you know, a pretty good percentage. Yeah, they want it to be perfect, but, you know, I think going from like a one nine to a two something is a significant thing, but the incremental ones, we just sort of let in the past let them know that over this it's going to change from X to X, and the server will be unavailable for about fifteen minutes. Is what it actually took, and then okay. Yeah, I just think there's a little bit of a. I think there's been some change going on with our population, you know, because. If you think back, we all started with, we have to give our students computers, right? That was the big thing for a while. Well, why do we have to do that? Because we all have to be on exactly the same version of every piece of software, right? And then over time, and, and oh, and you must either be a PC campus or a Mac campus, right? I mean, you know, it has to be exactly the same. 
And then over time, we've sort of gotten away from that. And we've sort of said, well, okay, students can bring anything they want, but faculty can't. Oh, God forbid, faculty can, you know. And so then we've gotten over that, right? So now everybody's bringing pretty much anything they want. And, and we've learned to deal with it, but they've also learned to deal with it, right? Because the student might not have the exact same edition of Excel that they have. And so, so everybody's kind of learned to deal with it. And it just feels like we're, the, the companies in this way are maybe helping us to sort of continue that sort of, you know, technology changes and sometimes it's a problem, but most of the time you get over it, you know? And, and so I think that we're, we IT are slower because, you know, we see this as an enterprise system, so we're slower to sort of be ready to let go then, you know, I mean, I'm still amazed by all the BYOD conversations that people feel like that's such a huge thing. It's like your students were always BYOD. Why do you think this is such a big deal, you know? But enterprise computing is still like, oh my God, BYOD, you know? And just like, geez, get over yourself, you know? So. One of the things on my campus that I know helps that the, the faculty let loose a little bit about complaining about things that didn't work perfectly was the mess of browsers and how browsers have been such a disaster. Um, and Moodle was a classic example. You know, something would work on a Friday and then on Monday it wouldn't work. And they'd complain and I'd say, did you try it in a different browser? And they'd try it in a different browser and it would work. And they'd say, so what's wrong with Moodle? I'd say, nothing's wrong with Moodle. Browser. That browser updated over the weekend yeah. without telling anybody, and they messed it up. And it's amazing. Semester to semester, there will be problems with specific browsers and specific machines. And you know, and I think the faculty kind of accepted that there was absolutely nothing we could do with the fact that Firefox on a Mac will not display PDFs anymore. And so the faculty kind of got used to saying, you have to try a different browser if something doesn't, if it doesn't work. I always say to students when they go, I'll say, I hope that you can tell your children, grandchildren about the browser wars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do. I like trying to make light of it because it is just like, you know, what are you trying to do? Did you try anything? That's the first question. Yeah. But I, I think that that is part of our obligation too, trying to help faculty to understand that, that all technology is not static. Mm -hmm. My previous institution, when we moved everyone to Google, I uh, had a, a fairly young faculty member in her early 30s come to me and say, I have already learned how to use two different email systems and I cannot believe that you're telling me I'm going to have to learn a third. So my job was sort of to try to explain to her that over her lifetime, she might be <laughs> learning many email systems. <laughs> But it was fascinating to me that it was just, it was not part of her world, and she really felt as if, you know, she'd invested in Moodle or in LMS or this kind of thing. Um, we all learned how to do algebra or solve a quadratic equation, and you don't have to think about it, doing it in a new way, um, and that that was very difficult. So I think that is part, younger faculty, I think, get it now, because they've been using all this stuff long enough that they've been fighting their own browsing boards in their personal life as well as everything else. But it is hard trying to do that. And then I think um, at UT Austin, because they have the huge problem of when do they make changes, because it always screws somebody up. Um, they years ago just announced when these big changes would happen, when one point changes would happen, and it was sort of like, this is when we're going to do it. It's on calendars, and it's going, and it's just, it's not just the sort of downtime in the IT space. It's <laughs> telling everybody, these software systems magically at this point in the calendar. So everybody always knows all the time that whether or not that happens this particular year, it is something that's an ongoing cycle. Yeah. And I think that that might be an interesting way to talk to people and say, so you can plan on it, you know, if we need to 
change banner or data tell or the LMS or something else is going to happen over this period of time and so you may want to think about when you come back from the Christmas holidays to just sort of check in because it could look totally different. Yeah, yeah. It's funny here that <clears throat> the very last group that allowed their students to bring their own device was our business school. <laughs> they were adamant that they their students needed to keep, we had to keep giving them laptops and all of that. And finally, some of the business faculty in talking amongst each other kind of said, well, you know, because they were like, no, there cannot be change, you know. And, and finally, some of the business faculty said, you know, are we really preparing our students for the business yeah. world? Yeah. If, we, if yeah. we sit here and say there cannot be change, Maybe we'd be doing our students a greater favor if we actually changed and, and they started to learn how to deal with that before they went into business, you know. And that, that change in their thinking finally got them to sort of get over the last hump that we were trying to push, you know. No, we don't want to give them their laptops anymore, you know. I mean, I don't know, I, I would guess all of our students are like this, that they're very... Um, they, they want to, they, they have great expectations, right? And our business school students, because we gave them their laptop as part of their tuition, it was like it was Rollins' laptop. And they didn't care what they did with it. They expected to be able to bring it to the help desk and, and be given another one, right? Oh, well, I spilled coffee all over my keyboard, but, you know, it's Rollins' laptop, so here you go. I expect a new one, you know? And I would actually tell my help desk that one of the things I wanted them to do when we handed out laptops is I wanted them to say to the students, please find the Rollins sticker, inventory sticker on your laptop, please. Right? And the kids would all be doing this, right? And then we would say, yeah, you see? No Rollins inventory sticker on this laptop. This is not Rollins' laptop. No. But we just, we had to get rid of buying them and giving them to them before we got over that. It was awful, you know. All right.